good afternoon. Buenas tardes. For those of you here in the East Coast, buenos dias. If there's anyone in a different time zone, West Coast, thank you all for being here. Welcome to our first Hispanics Hispanic Heritage Day with a keynote speaker here at Granite. Um, her name is Maria Hinojosa, and I'll be talking a little bit more about her in a minute. Today event, first and foremost, is possible thanks to our gracious CEO, Rob Hale, Granite founder and CEO, th through our Candid uh, Network event, which stands for Corporate Advancement, Networking, Diversity, um, Inclusion, um, and networking. We also have our Women's Network Weekend. Uh, Candid has a book club. That's how this got started. Thank you to Cal Swiss, our VP of Training and Development. A big shout out to Kim Myers, uh, who also helped me with a lot of logistics and the amazing team uh, that pulled this together. Uh, very important to remind everybody that Granite is committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what we're trying to do is to create a culture that is well, that makes Granite a welcoming place for everyone. We are a 1.8 billion revenue privately owned company with 2,500 employees and growing. Today, we serve 85 of the Fortune 100 companies in North America. Why are we here? Why do we celebrate Hispanic heritage? The Hispanic uh, population has accounted for nearly half of the population growth between 2010 and 2021. Uh, we, and I say we because I'm part of it, we have reached 62.5 million Hispanics, Latinos, Latinxes, Latin Americans, whatever you want to call us, as of 2021. And we represent 19% of that population. So that means we one in five Americans are in the US are Hispanic or Hispanic descent. Uh, on that note, fun facts about our granite internal diversity, 33% of our employees are women and 24% of our employees are self-identified as Hispanic. So we are doing our part in this conversation. Now, let's get started. Let me, I have the honor and pleasure to introduce the fabulosa Maria Hinojosa, and it rhymes. <laughs> um, for those who might or might not know, I used to work in media for a local Hispanic media startup. So Maria, you might or might not remember, but we met a few years ago at the WGBH uh, studio for a, a Hispanic heritage event, actually. Um, we have a few things in common, which is what also made me think of inviting you to this event. Uh, your name is Maria. My mom's name is Maria, too. Um, your son's name is Raul. My father's name was Raul. Your dad was a doctor. My dad was a doctor, too. Uh, different specialty, though. He, um, they both studied at UNAM, actually. Uh, so we have more in common that you might know. And now we are both Latinxes, Mexican-Americans, Mexican immigrants who have lived a bicultural life between Mexico and the U.S. and who are here now uh, today. So we have too much too much or so much in common. Um, Raul, Raul, this is Jeff. Uh, a few people are stuck in the uh, waiting room. Oh, uh, Nick. Nick can help us, or um, but they shouldn't because I set it up automatic. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so, Maria, thank you for accepting our invitation and share your fantastic journey with us. The way I will describe Maria, for those of you who are just getting to know her, if you haven't read the book. If you haven't, you must, or listen to the Audible at least, which is narrated by her. She is a Mexican immigrant, a Mexican American from Chicago, of course, a woman, but a bicultural and bilingual continuous learner. She's a journalist. She's the first Ivy Leaguer in her family. She's a woman entrepreneur. She's a working mom. 
She's a survivor of violence. She's a visionary leader. She's a fighter for immigration rights. She's an Emmy Award winner, and most recently a Pulitzer Award winner. She's a blogger. She's a storyteller. She's a TV personality, formerly with CNN, GBH, and many others. She has her own company now. She'll tell us about it. Uh, and a Latinx. My summary of all your accomplishments, Maria, en una sola palabra, una chingona. My first question to you. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you who don't know what it means, Google it. Don't do it on the corporate network, though. <laughs> you can. Um, so, Maria, what did I miss? And could you play? Could you please share a little bit more about yourself with our granite audience? Um, you missed that I'm a wife of 31 years to my That's husband, what? the extraordinary artist Herman Perez, whose work you see behind me, uh, who's from the Dominican Republic. And the fact that I'm a mom to two adult kids, Raul, Ariel Jesus de Todos los Santos Perez Hinojosa, and Maria Jurema Guadalupe de los Indios Perez Hinojosa, 27 and 24, almost 27 and 24, um, that I have two dogs, Walter and Benito Juarez, um, and two cats, Safia and Nico, um, and that I'm a boxer. I think, that's, I think other than that, you got it all. <laughs> the boxer I knew, because you had... You have or you used to have daily uh, Facebook posts in the morning with your fight club. So and I love that about you. Yep, the fight club is back. I'll be posting later today. All right. Good to hear. Good to hear. Um, so my second question to you then is since the publication uh, of One Saw Was You, and I know this is your second book because the other one is Racing Raul, right? Uh, actually, it's my third. So first was Cruz. Okay. Gang members talk to Maria Hinojosa. So that was my wow. first book. It was a, like a Studs Terkel book of interviews. Then it was Raising Raul, Adventures Raising Myself and My Son. Then Once I Was You, A Memoir of Love and Hate in a Tour in America. And just last month, we released a new book for kids. Once I Was You, Finding My Voice and Passing the Mic. And so that's the newest book for kids. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, so thank you for that fact check. You're a journalist, so thank you for doing that. Uh, it looks like I didn't do my full homework, and that's important. So after you published Once I Was You, what else has changed in your life? Tell us more. Um, I mean, publishing Once I Was You was not in my plan to be honest with you the country was living through such a difficult time and i just felt like i had a responsibility to kind of correct the narrative you know um for the last seven years basically there's been a narrative put out that mexicans latinos latinas latine latinex uh, immigrants refugees that we are takers that we are a problem that needs to be managed and solved, that we are at the border chomping at the bit, you know, that, and all of that is not true, really. Um, it's, it's, I, I actually had a very interesting uh, conversation with somebody from Connecticut, and this person wanted to talk to me about the border and, and what was happening at the border. And I said, oh, well, obviously you have opinions about what's going on. When was the last time that you were there? And, and she said, well, actually, I've never been. And then I was like, so I go all the time. I was just there. So we can talk about what I have seen. But I think right now, in terms of Latinos and Latinas, there's um, a lot of misinformation and disinformation. That's why I like doing these events, right? Because then in your company and in your corporate culture, there will be a conversation about like, right, so Latinos are everywhere, right? Every in every single state, and the most surprising actually, Ra is your name Raul? No, Raul, Raul. Okay, Tocayo de mi hijo. So, Raul, I'm gonna offer you a question What state has the largest Latino population growth in the United States? Largest and fastest. What state is it? 
growth, not actual population. Growth, exactly, growth. Uh, it has to be a northeast state, so it could actually be Massachusetts, but it could also be Pennsylvania. It's, it's yeah, mid, okay. Midwestern states. <clears throat> Somebody throw out a, a state. Well, like everybody. Colorado, Colorado, Utah. Colorado, Utah. Yeah, Colorado, yeah. Utah. yeah. yeah. Arizona. Say, uh, South Dakota. Who's saying that? Cali Who said South Dakota? I did. Mary. Yeah. Mary. Oh, Mary. So, so Mary's the closest. It's actually North Dakota. Wow. Um. So. So the Latino population growth is has been most intense in the southeast, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, all of that area. Um, and because of jobs, actually, North Dakota is booming. So all, I, all I'm trying to say is that Latinos are everywhere. We're the second largest voting population. We don't vote as a block, but the second largest voting population in the United States. But essentially, either people feel like we're invisible or we're just delivering their food or we are a problem and we're much more complex than all of that. 100%. And thank you for challenging us, not just me, but the entire audience on knowing those facts so we know what's happening with this growing population. So on that note, my next question to you would be from an immigration perspective in the US, what would you consider the most critical imperative around immigration policy? Uh, the biggest imperative right now is the lack of political will. There's just a, I have said to the the administration, well, you know, I'm a public commentator on TV, et cetera, and I, I have said to the Biden administration, you have had ample opportunity for the president to stand up and say, the whole immigration conversation, how we're handling everything about it needs to change and it needs to stop because this is out of control. When you take babies from their parents as a part of your policy, in the United States of America, this is not normal. It's not normal. When you have men on horses with whips chasing refugees, this is not normal. Or rather, maybe it is normal. But then we have to say, but we don't accept this. We don't accept this. So uh, to me, <laughs> it's... It's the lack of will. And by the way, for me, there has to be a reframing, right? Because I, I have been on the ground. You can ask me anything about immigration. I have been with a caravan. I have been on the borders dozens of times. I was in the jungle in Colombia and Panama. I have seen the migration become increasingly more black, which adds a whole other element to the conversation. And I have also seen U.S. Border Patrol ICE policies that that baffle because they are so inhuman. Um, and so the the only way that this changes is if you ba it has to be like a big moment. It basically has to be like a president having a prime time address that says for this and this and this reason because of all the deaths, because of the needless, you know, putting people in detention camps just the way it was during the so-called Japanese internment or turning away Jewish people when they were seeking refuge during World War II, because that happened in our country, mm -hmm. then this would be a moment for the president to have a national moment and say, we love immigrants and the immigrants and refugees who want to come here are the creme de la creme. They are the best, the brightest, the most determined, the most feminist, the most independent thinking, the most strategic, security conscious, best parents. 
you you think I'm talking about like you know I don't know like uh, the competitor for some big you know competition show and you know on primetime television? No, I'm talking about the migrants and the refugees. They are the best, and that narrative that they represent the worst is one that we have to change because it's not it's not the truth. And I just leave you with a data point so we're all clear. Yep, absolutely. What, no, one, thank you. One no. data point. One one data point. Oh, sorry. There is less crime in immigrant communities than there is in communities of U.S. citizens. There is less crime in immigrant communities, period. Well, thank you for sharing that. So in order to change the narrative to your point, which is needed, that's one of the reasons we have events like this in a corporate setting in 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 corporate america right and and it's happening not just at granite it ha it's happening everywhere um so you've described many personal events in your book uh i mentioned earlier you're an entrepreneur you you you've started your own company so what has been one of your most in impactful experiences as a leader and by that i mean as a latinx leader in your life i'm so lucky because i have been i have met you know so many latino and latina leaders um and so i i have had a chance to have these deep conversations you know somebody who i look up to is dolores huerta she was the right hand of Cesar Chavez, helped to create the United Farm Workers. She's the one who came up with that, si se puede, yes we can. Um, she's, I don't know, Dolores is probably pushing 90, maybe beyond 90. And um, every crisis in our country, specifically around Latinos and Latinas, she always talks about it as an opportunity to educate. And it, she's an activist, so she talks about organizing people. I'm a journalist, so... I think about an opportunity to have a dialogue about who we are um, and to to clarify who we are. And and by the way, yes, we're celebrating, your company is celebrating uh, Latinx Heritage Month, but it's important that we understand the economics of this community. Again, we are now in the process of having to deconstruct a narrative that was created and repeated and repeated and repeated that we are problems, that we are takers, that et cetera, et cetera. Actually, the U.S. housing market right now is being propped up because of Latino and Latina housing housing uh, purchases. One. Two, also the housing Business depends on Latinos and Latinas because we're the ones that are building the houses as well. If the Latino and Latina market was measured as a gross domestic product, it would be the seventh, between the sixth and seventh largest in the world. Latina consumers are the most powerful consumers, consumer products in the United States because why? Because we over index over white women and black women in terms of deciding what is gonna be bought in our home or what radio station we're gonna to listen to or what paper towels we're gonna to use or what dish soap or detergent or rice. And we are brand loyal. So once we start listening to that station or buying that rice, it will be in our families forever. So we are the most sought after consumer Latinos have surpassed both white kids and black pit kids at the rate at which we go from high school to college. So higher education has to be looking at Latinos and Latinas as being a pillar of their economic plan for the future. The median age of Latinos and Latinas is 11. So any company that wants to have a future, I mean, why did I write a book for kids? I mean, I wish I was younger because that's an audience that is reading me when they're 11 and they're going to, if I can keep on coming out with books, they're going to be reading me until the times they're 20 and then they'll buy all of my adult books. Like if you look at it as a business. So I'm just saying that we have this extraordinary power and that's why, again, I like doing these events so that people can just be like, oh, wow. And then, 
And then actually it's based on reality, right? So people need to be like, yeah, actually the Latinos and Latinas that I know are fill in the blank, hardworking, super productive, love to hang out, love their families. Uh, yes, we play our music loud. Ike, that's why I love living in Harlem. But, you know, basically it's like you'll, the truth of who we are versus the images that you have. And I always tell people, especially in these events, base it on your reality, on who you see who is Latino and Latina in your community. And again, we're everywhere. We're medical doctors or we're, you know, whatever, uh, lawyers, judges d delivering your food. But we are, in fact, everywhere. And so we are already a part of you in the United States. Yeah. I would add to that, if I may, that sales professionals, uh, engineer professionals, because we have a, a handful in the audience here and IT professionals that are part of Granite. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, 23% of our uh, employees identify as Hispanics or Hispanic descent. So th that's a great point. And I concur with you. It's a, it's a business case prerogative or imperative rather the, to 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 continue to have this candid pun intended uh conversation uh about uh, dei diversity equity and inclusion uh in not in many corporations and in and, and across the country so thank you maria for that great reminder of the business case for business leaders um since you published the book then, going back to, to your most recent uh, book, and this uh, narrative or story, do you think that nowadays people are more receptive, receptive to the overarching message? Or if I may rephrase that, what has changed in the past 20 years? Actually, <clears throat> We're in a very challenging spot. There was um, there was a poll released um, in the last month or so <clears throat> by National Public Radio (NPR) um, that came back with about just over 50 percent, or about 50 percent of Americans believe that. And don't quote me on this, but basically that there is a crisis at the border. The wall, you know, needs to to kind of take care of the problem. <clears throat> this is a huge problem. If you have an NPR, anybody who answers a, a survey from NPR means that they're educated, they're aware, they're, they understand kind of who they're talking to. And if those educated people are saying that they have a fear, about half of them, about the southern border, we have a problem. Because again, in speaking to this person who was just like, oh, my God, the border's out of control. Oh, my God. And I was like, but when were you last there? <laughs> like, so that you can say that with any authority. And, you know, as I thought about that, Raul, I was like, you know, what's actually out of control on the border is actually the militarization of the border. Uh, Raul, I don't know the last time that you were down, but, you know, we used to be able to and it was a beautiful relationship between Mexico and U.S., right? We would have the friendship bridges, the international bridge, the peace bridge, where you could walk between Mexico, whatever, Juarez, El Paso, eh, McAllen, Matamoros. You would, you could walk. Nogales, and it was just like Nogales. And it was, yep. it was about the bridges between the two countries. Those bridges now have barbed wire all around you. The barbed wire is on the side and on top of you, as if, perdón, as if we're animals that need to be caged in as we're walking across a bridge. So what's out of control is the militarization. Last week, two vigilantes picked up their guns and shot two migrants, killing one of them. So this is why we don't use the term illegal to describe human beings, right? So in your company, you know, in my company, you'll never hear the word illegal being used to describe or label a human being. And I learned this not from a radical Latino studies 
you know, I learned it from Elie Wiesel, who survived the Holocaust. He said the first thing the Nazis did was to declare the Jews to be an illegal people. Wow, that's so, so in our yeah, so in our country now and in Mexico now, Raúl, desafortunadamente, there is this notion of a human being as an illegal person, and this is so dangerous and damning for humanity. Hmm. Thank you for sharing. So, the, the, if I hear you obviously loud and clear, this conversation is about creating that awareness and, and, and making sure that, that people are responsible in, in getting their facts right. So again, thank you for sharing that. Um, pivoting a little bit back to your own life and your own experience, who was the most influential role model for you growing up? Uh, yeah, my mom, for sure. Um, and I think, it, well, one, my mom, now I understand, really came to my defense. She she stood up and said, you can't take my daughter away. And there's something really powerful about that that I think is transmitted just through through that moment of, of trauma. Um, but also my mom, it, I think my mom explained, showed me, didn't ever talk to me about it, <clears throat> but showed me what it is to speak to people from any kind of a background with respect, while at the same time having self-respect. You don't make yourself small and you don't make yourself big, although sometimes she did. But in other words, it was about balancing humility with her power to own her voice, which allowed her to speak to the kids who were at the gasolineria every time we would stop because we drove from Chicago to Mexico in our car, in our station wagon. So the kids at the gas station, she would speak to them with the same kind of presence that she would speak to a rich Mexican or a soldier uh, or a anyone. And so I think that she showed me how, and she also, you know, she understood justice. Like she was, we were not American citizens, but we were growing up in the civil rights era. And like many immigrant moms right now, during the uh, the moment of of the 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 visibility of the Black Lives Matter movement on the streets, eh, my mom identified with the civil rights movement. She identified with the struggle of Black people for representation and justice, and so she taught me this. Um, not again, not by saying, but by doing. So yeah, she's definitely also. She's now, I think she's 86, and she um, is a swimmer, a long-distance swimmer in Lake Michigan. She's still, she'll swim a mile, maybe two. That's amazing. Wow. And what I'm hearing from you is she just passed through you the golden rule, because what you're saying is treat everyone with respect. That's the golden rule, right? That's yeah. amazing. It, it works as a journalist, honestly. It's a really good, and if you can find a way to have a heart in the midst of that, very important for journalists. Wow. So that was your most influential role model growing up in your family. Now, thinking of the future, who do you see as the most influential emerging leader today advancing Latinx, Hispanic causes, whether it's a business leader, whether it's a political leader, who who's on your radar? Well, I I say this with some reservation because I, I'm not a fan of politicians writ large. Um, but I think any young person, if you ask them, if you, you know, put three people in front of them in terms of who's the most interesting and dynamic politician, I think they would say Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, AOC, because she just, she, she's young. She knows how to talk to a younger generation, how to communicate with them. She's got millions of followers and she's the new breed of American um, uh, political, politically elected as the left, actually. I mean, she's a democratic socialist. 
uh, and I don't even know if she calls herself a democratic socialist or straight up just a socialist, but um, I, I just think that because the median age of Latinos and Latinas is 11, and because of the way in which she operates with people, with people on TikTok and Insta and et cetera, I just think that she's uh, somebody who I, I'm, I'm watching, you know, in, in terms of the politics. And and somebody else, surprisingly, who I um, I've I've actually been able I was with her in a in a kind of private space is America Ferrara, uh, the actress from Ugly Betty, who is actually um, she's kind of developed into a full blown political activist uh, with the time that she's not directing or producing um, or acting. And um, so she's somebody who, as you, you say, is on my radar in terms of politics and also an entrepreneur, just like you are, as you said, she's a producer. She, and uh, yeah, and 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 a lot of her shows have that nuance of borderline with political. I, I I'm a big fan of Gentrified, which I'm so sad <laughs> it got canceled on Netflix. So for those of you who haven't watched it, I recommend it. One day we'll understand what's going on with Netflix. <laughs> so it's 1230. Um, I still have a few extra questions of my own here, but I see that Tame in our chat is already asking our audience to post a few additional. So um, Mary on the chat is saying, uh, besides educating myself, how do I help change the narrative? That's a great question. Um... When Mary, you think about it, please bring more questions to us. I would I would base my answer actually in your reality. And I don't know enough about you, but for example, um, so in, in my town with my friend who was saying that she knows all about the border, and it's just like, well, let's think about the Latinos and Latinas that you do see here in our small town. Think about the little local diner where everybody eats. Think about who's in the kitchen there for the 16 hours. Think of their faces. Think of how you feel about the fact that they're serving you your food and you trust them to cook for you. Why, you know, what, what is the threat that you perceive? Is there really a threat? So it's more, it's it's just being able to, and engage in these conversations get sometimes can be a little bit uh, difficult but i think if we approach them with a certain level of humility um and curiosity so that if you hear somebody say something something illegal immigrant you can stop them and say you know what can we talk about that that term because it's a term that everybody uses but actually it's grammatically incorrect why? Because there is no such thing as an illegal human being. No. So illegal immigrant is an immigrant who has committed a crime, and broken a law. OK, it's an immigrant who, who it's not an illegal person. By the way, crossing the border without documents is a misdemeanor. It has become criminalized. Right. So if you get caught more than once, it can be bumped up into a felony. And you're being felonized for coming back to be with your kids. Let's just make that clear. But um, the notion of uh, so so people are like, I still don't get it. Like illegal immigrants sounds like the right thing. And I'm like, OK, well, so illegal, let's say all of you are drivers. Right. And you've all probably gotten a ticket at one point. That means that you would forever be known as an illegal driver. Oh, Raul, the illegal driver, the guy that got all the tickets or Mary didn't pay her taxes one year. Oh, you mean Mary, the illegal taxpayer? Uh, the dad who didn't pay his alimony. Oh, you mean Bob, the illegal dad? Grammatically, it does not, it, it's not correct. Illegal is not a noun, right? You are not an illegal. So you can do that in conversation and just be like, let's think about that. And then you can say, if there's resistance, it's like, well, actually, the person who really 
who, who discussed this survived the Holocaust. He was the one who said the Jews, de- the, the Nazis declared the Jews to be an illegal people. So I just think there's all kinds of opportunities. I was um, a, an undocumented artist, very successful undocumented artist, visited my my class at Barnard College yesterday, and one of my students said, Please "What can I do?" Yourself. To one of my um, one of my students said, uh, "What can I do to be a better ally?" <laughs> and Yos- Yosimar, who is undocumented and a queer artist, you know, film the uh, theater guy. And he said, look people who are serving you in the eye and tip better and be nicer. And I was like, there's also that. Like, I'm, thank you for bringing me my food, Susanita. I'm a, if I can, I'm showing you, I'm gonna show you what I, what I think with, with cash. Thankfully, I'm at a point in my life because I've paid off the college debt that I can do that, right? And I, I will leave. I'm not trying to brag or anything, but I will leave a $20 tip at the hotel and I'll be like the woman who's going to clean this. I know this $20 is going to go into the account for her kid's college. And so it's the way of understanding that they undocumented people, Latinos and Latinas are everywhere around us. And also to break the notion that they are only delivering our pizza because my father, may he rest in peace, helped to create the cochlear implant. Wow. It's a, it's a way of paying it forward, so thank you. We have a question on the chat from Andre. Um, and Andre, hopefully I'll make justice to it. It's a, it's a little long, uh, but it says, there's huge difference between refugees and economic migrants. A lot of people believe that Latin immigrants come as economic migrants when in fact they mostly come over as refugees escaping hardships that have been caused by the United States, like the uh, the Reagan government administration sending military to El Salvador during the Civil War, which created um, indeed a a further crisis. Um, So, Andrea, I see this more of as a statement, but I guess if I may No, 100%. What, just, the, just the difference. What what what's your take on the difference? One hundred and fifty percent. Andrew, you said. Andrew Andre. is somebody who has a. Perdón. Andre. Andre. Andre Rodriguez. Okay. Andre clearly has a clear a, a, an understanding of history. You're exactly right. So, at around the years two thousand or so, when. You know, 9-11 had happened and people were like, oh, my God, immigrants and refugees are so terrible. And I remember saying, right now, the migrants who are coming are mostly Mexican. And it's it's a population that you actually can understand. But the Central American migrant is coming with a whole other dynamic because they have their countries have been brutalized by, you know, authoritarian regimes, military regimes, anti-democratic regimes. The United States has propped these up or fought against them, but in, in, in strange ways. And so I used to say, at one point, you wish that all your migrants were just Mexican because it's a very different population. And now, in fact, you're exactly right. The people who are leaving... Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras. It's not just a question of the economy. It's not. Obviously, they want a better life and an economic stability provides that. But it is because of, so you're like, what? The climate, right? So you have hurricanes that are displacing people, that they have nothing to do with hurricanes that are impacted because we emit so much greenhouse gases. You have people that are being displaced because you have mining companies, U.S., Canadian, Spanish, German, that are coming in to take all the natural resources and people are being taken off their land. And they're being fought against by armed militias. Uh, You have um, violence against women that is and, and violence against gay and queer trans people that is unjust. So. And and Mexico, by the way, the Mexican economy is strong. 
it is an economy that ha- that continues to see growth. So the economic push, it is it is there, by the way, because I was just on the border with Mexico and I, me sorprendió. I was surprised to see how many Mexicans were leaving. I was like, wow, okay. So not it, the, the trickle down, it's not getting to everybody. But you are exactly right. The overwhelming number of people who are coming right now from Central America, from Haiti, from parts of Africa, overwhelmingly need some kind of help and assistance. Uh, they are running away from things. But don't get me wrong. They are not people who are saying, oh, my God, let me get to the United States so that I can get on public assistance. Let me just get to the States so that I can get a welfare check. Never. Never. There's not even the concept of that. It is let me get there because I know I can work as hard as possible and something will happen. I won't be stuck. Thank you for saying that. One of my big takeaways from reading your book is that your story is the American dream. And I want to say it out loud because you are a big representation for Latinos or Latinx for the American dream. So thank you. We're going to pivot in topic. Pamela. Um, I'll take that. I'll take that only because I think my dad would be like, oh, that's so sweet. But I think the dream is the one that we create. And for me, it's about democracy. La verdad. I mean, I sure. just I really want our country to thrive and You can't have a country that is thriving when there's so much fear about the population that is the second largest population in your country. It doesn't make sense. It's not a recipe for growth. It's a recipe for stagnation. And disasters. But yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So we're going to pivot to one of the other topics in your book, which is uh, mental health. Um, I have a couple questions on that. Uh, and Pam Carpenter is asking on the chat, she says, when reading your book, I was impacted by your feeling of having imposter syndrome. You seem like you have a lot of confidence and are outspoken. What was the turning point from being an imposter to owning your whole self? Hmm. You know, I have to, it's actually very interesting. I don't know if anybody's ever said, like, what was the moment? So I do have to think about it. Like, was there a moment or rather an accumulation of gathering information from people who I was always asking, like, do you ever get that little voice that tells you that you can't do this or that you shouldn't be where you are or that little voice that tells you that you're a fraud, that that you're going to be discovered for for not actually being able to do anything. Um, and so I did a lot of therapy, years of therapy. I kind of feel like, God, you, you know, you spent all that money trying to resolve this. You know, I, hopefully we can help other people to not have it so that, by the way, I love therapists, but let's talk about other things, right? Instead of just this one, one revolving issue. So I think there was a moment when, And I'll share this with you because I, I love having visual cues for things. When I interviewed um, Rita Moreno, the EGOT, you know, star of One Day Out of Time, the West Side Story, um, just the most incredible Latina actress that everybody must know, who's also in her 90s. Um, and I asked her, what did she ever feel like there was a little voice that was telling her, like, who do you think you are? Like, what are you doing here? And she said, oh, I get it all the time. And this is somebody who's won Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, Tony, now a SAG award and a Peabody, I, I believe. So she's like over the top. And she said, whenever I hear that little voice, what I do is I name the little voice and I send her in punishment upstairs to her bedroom and she's to close the door and not come out. And so this notion of just <laughs> like, You know, Rita Moreno, who is everything, I mean, everything, and that she knows how to just calm that voice down. And also, that is one of the great things about getting older, la verdad, is that you really just are, you, it's much easier to be in your power. And when you run your own company, and, you know, I mean, it was so scary at first, so terrifying. 
call myself a media entrepreneur or businesswoman. I was like, no, 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 no. Um, and no, I am a media entrepreneur. We've, you know, survived so many things that um, I know the place I have to. It's important that I stand up and I say, my company did this. It won the Pulitzer, the first time the Pulitzer has ever recognized a Latina run media company. Mm-hmm. My company won the Peabody weed. So it's the opposite of the imposter syndrome. It's actually understanding that it's important for us to claim our space humbly, but with our backs straight and our shoulders pulled back. Bravo. And the Pulitzer, for those who don't know, is for Suave. Is it Suave or Suavecito? So, suave. Well, it's Suave, but his friends in prison called him Suave, like the shampoo. And we did just win the Pulitzer, which is a, a game changer for us. It's um, it's our seven-part podcast series. You can find it anywhere. It's called Suave or Suave. And... Um, it's just of a dramatic story of a young man who I meet in Philadelphia when he was uh, sentenced to life in prison without parole as a juvenile. And he was never going to come out until the Supreme Court made this decision uh, that said that that sentence is inhuman. And um, and then he gets out and there's just it's a very great roller coaster ride of a binge. And we're already working on season two right now. Wow. And he was your source for a number of years, correct? Yeah, he was a man who was in prison and, <clears throat> you know, journalists have a very hard time getting into prisons. So he was always talking about what was happening in prison. There was never a moment when there was a, a big moment at that prison where he was like, I'm your source on the ground. But that communication that started kind of with Christmas cards, because I knew where he was going to live for the rest of his life. I had his address. How could I not? I'm a Christmas card lady. How could I not send this kid a Christmas card every year? It's the least I can do to say, I'm remembering you. And that gesture led to all of these years of contact that lead to this podcast that lead to us winning uh, an International Documentary Association Award, an IDA, which is huge, and winning the, the Pulitzer well, congrat- first, so congratulations and big cheers. Bravo. Felicidades. Thank you. Um, as a just quick follow up, we have about 13 more minutes to go. Um, as a follow up to Pam's question, uh, which has to do with mental health. Mental health is one of the topics that you chose to to open up and, and, and you open up in such amazing ways in that book that it's remarkable. Um, my question to you, we, and in fact, here at Granite, we're trying to create awareness about mental health. We have further initiatives that will be announced, so this is a heads up. But have we arrived where we need to be? Is there still work to be done? What's your take on mental health in general? Yeah, no, we have a lot of work to do. A lot of work. I mean, it's definitely not the way it used to be. We can talk about mental health. We can talk about mental illness. We can talk about depression. Um, it's it's not the way it used to be when people would say mental health and they were like, "What are you What are you talking about exactly?" Like, I don't understand. People understand now, and certainly after living through a a, a pandemic, when people slipped into depression because it was frankly depressing what we've been living through. Um, in the Latino Latina community, you know, the rates of attempted suicide for teenage girls are very high. Attempted, not completed. Attempted suicide. Um, you know, it's been happening for decades. It has to do with this kind of cultural not fitting in that gets repeated generationally. Um, you know, I think our population is growing, therefore there will be more issues around mental health. And for example, I I just met a Latina who is uh, actually, this is like her big issue is Latinos and Latinas and disability, disability writ large. Turns out her disability is mental health and she has OCD. 
um, and a very particular kind of OCD that seems, you know, kind of focused on Latinos and Latinas. So I, as a journalist, I'm deeply interested. Um, so to me, I, I talk a lot about doing therapy, my therapist, having a therapist, um, right now I'm, I'm, I'm lapsed. So I have to get back to my therapist. Like I keep on, you know, because it has to be a priority and it's not, you know, not like everybody's like, Oh my God, I really look forward to going and talking about myself for the next hour. Cause it's a bit of work, right? Obviously it's work, but ultimately it makes us into better human beings, which makes our families happier. <laughs> so, and when your families are happy, you know, it's just much better all around. And I also meditate. I meditate. Um, it was a fellow Mexican journalist who kind of scolded me into understanding the importance of meditation. And so I am, I, I also like to be that person who says, look, you don't have to sit like a Buddha. You know, when you meditate, there's walking meditation, there's meditation that you can just do, especially because we live with our phones and our earbuds. So it's, um, and its effects are not even kind of not immediate, but they have an impact. So I'm all about talking about mental health and talking about ways that we can deal with it. By the way, there's a lot of shame. I understand it. So it's all getting, we can do it's is getting rid engage. of the stigma, uh, exactly. my, my takeaway. And that's what I, I think, to your point, that's the work that needs to be done. So in the last nine minutes, one, one question from John McNeely. Uh, we're going to go back to your career. He's saying, in starting your career as a Latino female journalist in what at the time was predominantly white male dominated field, is there a moment you remember where a boss or colleague had a bias or misconceptions about you that you were able to turn into a teachable moment for <laughs> them that made them a better person? Well, I, I don't know if it made them a better person, but I'm going to give you two, two moments that actually happened that were kind of hard for me because I was very young when this happened. And so I didn't really understand. And one of my editors at NPR said to me, oh, Maria, we all know about you and your agenda. And I was a budding correspondent at NPR. This was my career and that I had fought to get to this place. And so when he said that, he said, oh, we know about your agenda. And I was like, what, what agenda? What are you talking about? Because a journalist with an agenda is a journalist with, you know, a question of credibility, right? Lack of integrity. So, Correct. And so he said, well, you know, we all know about your Latino agenda. And I was like, what? You think I have a Latino agenda? And I said to him, I said, well, then you must have a white male agenda. To which he said, no, 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 no. It's different. I said, no, it's not. So I remember now I think he took pause, you know, did he actually learn? I think ultimately, right, the, these conversations. But he also said, again, there was another moment when he um, he was from the Midwest. And so and I'm from New York. And so there was an element of let, let's let educate a little bit how things are in New York or Latinidad. So this is the early 90s, mid 90s. And he said something about, well, you know, something, something you can go sacrifice those chickens. Because in the Yoruba, Afro-Cuban, Afro-Caribbean, uh, there is a spiritual tradition. People know it as Santeria or Yoruba. It's actually a very gentle religion, but there's this like notion that, you know, so you sacrifice chickens. And, and so he said it in a way that was uh, disrespectful. And uh, there are many people close to me that are part of this uh, religion and belief system. And so I said, I said, do you know who else sacrifices chickens for their holy days? And he was like, who? And I said, the Hasidic Jews. I don't know which one. Is it Yom Kippur that just passed? But they will take the chicken and they will. The, the part of the ritual is to take the chicken and uh, circle it over their heads until the chicken dies. I just snap the. Wow. We didn't have a, a, a moment to say, so what do you think? But. Those were just very early on. And like that, there have been so many. Um, and I, I appreciate that the question ended with what's a teachable moment. I, I guess, you know, 
I'll tell you a teachable moment that was uh, could have been so good, which was actually at my daughter's high school, a private elite prep school in New York City, where you think the most educated of the educated, and they told her Mexican jokes. Um, and when I told the school director, like, this is happening, they, they were just horrified. They couldn't believe that their brilliant students would say such a thing. And it was like, but let's have a teachable moment. Let's have a, a school-wide, not to point somebody out, but to say, what does it mean when we say this? Let's learn. Such an important teachable moment. So I appreciate the question and, and ending up in teachable moments. Well, on really that great note, questions from your team, by the way. I'm, I'm liking your you. question. I mean, on that note, on the five minutes that we have, if I can sort of try to wrap it up, this whole conversation with you, you're all always very enlightening. I, I've followed you for years. Um, and this has been a whole teachable moment for us learning from you. I, I hope that has been the feeling for our audience today, which is very mixed. We have Hispanics in the group, but we have a lot of allies. And that's what's great about Granite. Granite has this culture that we are making welcoming for everyone. So, um, Unless anyone else has any last question, I'll just pass it back to you, Maria, if you want to uh, bring it home with some closing remarks, and then we'll wrap up in four minutes. Well, one, thank you. And I, I love the fact that you talk about the culture that you're trying to create at Granite. Um, one, because this is the future of our country. Um, no one's really going anywhere, and we have to figure this out. We, as adults, have to figure out how to live in a society that is changing, where demographics are changing. You know, uh, how, how do we do it? So I really appreciate the possibility. And, and the fact that everybody's, like, really interested and engaged, your questions were, like, solid, solid questions. So you got a 10. Um <laughs> Thank you. But I also I also want to put it in the context of like, but it shouldn't be like we're giving you this handout, you know, we're we're giving you this thing and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna let you in. No, it's not that's not the way the conversation should be going. Historically, actually, the first people to arrive that were not of this continent indigenous, they arrived at St. Augustine and it was the Spaniards. And so the second language that was spoken apart from the indigenous languages was Spanish on this land. Then came the pilgrims. So it's an understanding that Latinidad and Latinos are part of who we always have been. And so <clears throat> it's not the handout and let's do better. It's like, geez, like these are my people. You know, our democracy in many ways, um, you know, has been led and saved by black women. So, like, black women, if we love democracy, are our people, right? Because they believe so strongly in democracy. Well, Latinos and Latinas are our people, not your people, not my people. They're our people because, again, and now I'll just say, because if you want your company to survive, that's what we're talking about. So it's about doing good. It's about seeing. It's about humanity. But it's also about making the best business choices that we can, or in my case, the best journalism choices that we can. So please go to Futuro Media, check us out, listen to all our podcasts that are just phenomenal, whether it's anything for Selena or Loud um, or Chalino, all of our Suave, obviously, Latino USA in the thick, and enjoy. And thank you so much for having me. I love your energy. By the way, Mary posted the Futuro Media link on the chat. So it's right there for everyone and it's being recorded. So we'll we'll share it. Thank and you, Mary. That's a good ally right there. The, absolutely. Mary is fabulous. Um, so yes, this has been phenomenal. Thank you for closing with those remarks. We stand together as as, as a company, as a group, as a country, as humanity. I love to quote JFK all the time. Don't don't um don't ask yourself what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And then I always flip it like, ask what you can do for granted. Uh, so 
that that's always my little motto and and that's leadership so again maria you're a fabulous leader you're a role model you're admirable and thank you again for being with us thank you have a great day everybody